So as the title says, I'm going to be talking about preschool as a strategy, and I had a lot of um, lead-in already from uh, Sean's talk in the morning that sort of talked about the um, large gaps that uh, they see in third grade and persist, and also from Rutgers' talk that showed some of the large long-term uh, impacts of uh, Head Start. So as a starting point, just some uh, big picture facts around the relationship between um, early childhood inequalities and longer term um, outcomes. Uh, Sean and Jimena Portilla have done some work looking at kind of the most recent data that we have about inequality um, uh, among very young children. And so in 2010, there's about a, more than a standard deviation gap between kids at the 90th percentile and kids at the 10th percentile as far as both reading and math scores. And we know from a bunch of different work now that those early gaps that we see at kindergarten entry or even before kindergarten entry are strongly predictive of a variety of different outcomes as kids um, move through school and then also later life outcomes we care about like educational attainment overall and income. So early childhood interventions are seen as one strategy to uh, tackle those gaps. Um, and this is a, a Heckman quote, investing in disadvantaged young children reduces the inequality associated with the accident of birth and at the same time raises the productivity of society at large. So there's been a lot of momentum in recent years around early childhood and using early childhood as a way um, both to kind of ameliorate the gaps but also hopefully to ho uh, stop them from even opening up in the first place. Um, so to give a bit of a sense, these are trends in preschool participation over time and you can see that there's this big increase since the 80s in preschool participation but what's notable is that the public preschool participation which is that green line is the one that's really increasing from the mid-90s onwards. And so uh, private preschool enrollment really flattens out, and it's really the expansion of public schools uh, in recent years. And a lot of that, the bulk of that, is coming from the um, emergence of state preschool programs. So this is just from, um, that should say 2002, not 2000 on the top there, but since 2002, there's basically been about a doubling in the likelihood kids are enrolled in public preschool and um, more than a doubling in the uh, amount of money states are spending on public preschool from 2.4 to 6.2, uh, not just dollars, but billion dollars. Um, <laughs> so basically, um, what we'd want to know is as, as public investment and particularly state investment in um, preschool has gone up in, in a relatively short amount of time, has that sort of mapped into, onto uh, narrowing and achievement gaps? Like, did preschool lead us to have less inequality at school entry? Um, and and the, the, the short answer is that we don't have really good answer to that. And um, what we do have is a bunch of studies about kind of preschool interventions. And from those studies, we have kind of these existence proofs that high quality preschools can have a really uh, large impact, and we also have more and more studies looking at these state preschools that have opened up. And the studies of the state preschool programs haven't had as long to, um, to sort of prove themselves, but they do systematically show positive benefits on these kind of gaps at kindergarten entry. So like when you finish going to this state preschool program, the kids who went seem to do better on a host of behavioral and academic um, outcomes relative to other kids. But the benefits from these programs are not in the ballpark of the benefits from larger um, pro or, or the more intensive programs that happened years ago that have been uh, that have lasted long enough to sort of track longer term outcomes. So this is a graph from a paper Greg Duncan and Catherine Magnuson did um, based on the work they've done doing uh, a large meta analysis of any of the studies around the impacts of preschool. And what you can s sort of see is the x axis is just years where the study where the preschool took place, and it's kind of a downward trend in the effects of preschool, uh, and they've limited themselves to the kind of the more rigorous studies. So you can see on the left the kind of Perry and Abbasidarian, and then the National Head Start uh, Impact Study, which is on the right. But in general, it seems that since about the mid 80s, the impacts of preschool interventions look much smaller relative to the ones that we talk about the long term impacts of. And so a lot of this has to do with uh, a changing counterfactual, and uh, people mentioned that a little bit earlier today as well. 
um, the, treatment the treatment contrast of what it means to go to one of these state preschool programs today is really different than what it used to um, in, say, Perry or Abbasidarian, where there weren't a lot of child care options. And typically, if a child wasn't in the program, they were with a relative or a neighbor or in some sort of home-based setting. Today, about 80% of four-year-olds are in some kind of child care setting already. So if you move them from a child care center to a preschool and a public school, the contrast between that is, is not going to be as great as moving them from um, you know, a, a babysitter or a neighbor taking care of them. And there's also lots of evidence that um, home environments are changing, both for low-income and high-income kids, as far as the way that parents are investing in their kids. One of the things we've seen is that there's been kind of a, a growing inequality in parental investments such that while all parents seem to be spending more time with their kids or spending more dollars on their kids, the growth has been far, far more pronounced among high-income families than low-income um, families. So, um, and, and, and as just a couple of examples of that, um, I've been tracking a lot of the kind of um, examples of sort of high-income parents being very concerned about their young kids' development and achievement early on. So th these are about kind of tutoring programs for two to four-year-olds to prepare them for the, the rigors of life. Um, <laughs> this is a, a documentary all about the process of getting into selective preschools in New York City and an article about uh, parents holding back their kids from even starting kindergarten so that they can be the older, older in the class, the oldest in the class as opposed to the youngest in the class. So there's all these examples of high income parents trying, uh, apparently very concerned about their very young children's sort of position early on. And so taken together, it's hard to um, sort of know what has happened to, to these gaps at school entry because we have seen this very large growth in public spending in early childhood, but there's these other trends, a change in counterfactual, a change in what kids are doing, and, and so we don't yet know how much these preschools um, have, have sort of paid off. So the questions I'm going to talk about for the rest of the talk are, one, um, just what has happened to school readiness gaps over this period of um, heightened investment in early childhood, Two, once we see what's happened, can we link that to the, to the preschool um, changes over time? So has the expansion in preschool access, uh, does that explain patterns in school readiness? And then quickly, if I have time, I also want to talk about just uh, a little bit about some new work I'm doing around um, accountability efforts that have become um, really popular just since around t uh, 2011 as efforts to improve the quality of early childhood settings. So the first question is just, um, what has happened to early childhood achievement gaps. And, and, and the reason nobody has really looked at this very much is because there hasn't really been any data. So um, we usually talk about test score gaps focusing on NAEP or focusing on uh, starting in third grade because that's um, what data exists. But um, a data set that's been fortuitous for these kinds of questions is the early childhood longitudinal study. Lots of people used the 98 data, and when the 2010 cohort came out, it gave an opportunity for the first time to look at how um, whether what kids know at school entry has changed and how gaps across different kinds of kids um, have changed over time. So the, the answer to the question um, it is, and this is um, a figure that Sean and Mena made in their paper where they looked at the ch the exactly this question of how have the gaps changed, shows that gaps narrowed pretty uh, relatively substantially over um, a, uh, a relatively short period of time. So from 98 to 2010, this is the year the children entered um, kindergarten, you see about a 0.2 of a standard deviation decrease in the size of um, the achievement gaps between kids in the 90th and 10th uh, percentile of income. And so that was encouraging and in some ways um, unexpected to everyone that has been following kind of all the research that has suggested growing achievement gaps rather than narrowing gaps. And then in, in work that I've done with um, one of my graduate students, we wanted to know, so when, when um, in Sean's paper, what it shows is that gaps have narrowed, but gaps could have narrowed either because um, low-income kids are catching up or potentially because high-income kids are knowing less. Uh, that didn't really answer the question of what kids know. And the reason for that is because there aren't 
data yet that allow you to take the direct assessments. Uh, there isn't a way yet to take the direct assessments in the ECHLs and compare them on the skills. But so what uh, we did in our study is just use teacher reports of what kids know, and we found really substantial increases between the 98 and 2010 data in what kindergarten teachers reported about individual kids' knowledge at the beginning of um, kindergarten. So that picture on the top left is just, um, does the child easily name uppercase and lowercase letters? And you can see that um, the bulk of the distribution in 98, which are those gray bars, said not yet. So that was the most common. And then basically the distribution flips so that in 2010 the most common answer was, yeah, consistently they know how to do this thing. And so um, across, there's something like 16 measures of kind of basic literacy and math. They didn't all change the same amount, but all of them sort of flipped and increased such that it seemed that kids uh, knew more at kindergarten entry in 2010 than they did in 98. And then we wanted to know, okay, but did that happen more so for the low income or high income kids? And what we saw was that consistent with kind of what, what Sean found in his paper, the gaps um, were narrowing in these teacher reported school readiness uh, skills. So everyone knew more in 2010. All groups seemed to start kindergarten with more of these basic skills, but the increases over time were most pronounced for low income kids. So taken together, it, it, it seemed to provide sort of consistent evidence that not only were gaps narrowing, kids seemed to be knowing more um, at, at kindergarten entry. So then um, what we've wanted to know is can we link those changes to preschool at all? Is this, is this about access to childcare? And this is uh, joint work with a bunch of different people, two of which are here. So Jenna, I think, is somewhere. Yeah, Jenna is over there, and Sean, as well as uh, Rehak Lee and Jane Waldfogel. And so I'm going to show you a couple of pictures of what we found looking at um, trends over time in, in child care participation across groups, and then they're linked to um, those outcomes. So this first picture is just the likelihood that children are in parent care in the year before, um, before kindergarten. And so the green line is showing you the patterns in 2010, which is our most recent year, and the orange line is the 98 pattern. And so um, this is suggesting that actually what we see is that there is an increase for low-income kids, this gap over here, such that in 2010, low-income kids are more likely to be in parental care than they are to be in any kind of out-of-home care. So that is, um, we suspect, largely because of the uh, financial crisis and people being out of work. But rather than seeing kind of this increase in the likelihood that kids are in preschool or particularly that low-income kids are in preschool, what we found that was that overall kids were more likely to be, low-income kids were more likely to be at home with a parent. Everywhere else on the distribution, it looks pretty relatively stable. And then we asked, well, what about kind of the public preschool versus the private child care centers? And so um, if the, the um, dotted lines are the public, uh, preschool and the solid ones are the uh, public. And you can see for, um, okay, so for what, what we found is that for high income kids, if you look at the private care, they were more likely in the pre-period to be in um, private care and they shifted down, less use of private care. And over here, you see that higher income kids, kids on the higher end of the income um, distribution shifted into public care. So overall, what we see is no big difference in the patterns of low-income kids being in public um, preschool, and in fact, a drop that is explained by this uh, shift towards parental care. And this shifting of middle and high-income kids from being in private setting to being in public setting. So some, something of a kind of a crowding out where public preschools are serving more middle and high-income kids. So taken together, the enrollment patterns we observed don't seem very consistent with the idea of narrowing gaps. We weren't seeing this kind of increase in kids being in preschool and definitely not a disproportionate increase of um, low-income kids being in um, preschool. In fact, overall, the care use seemed really um, stable over time, which surprised us given the pictures I showed you about kind of the increase in public spending. And it seems to imply that a lot of that has been um, sort of crowd, people switching out of private setting and into public settings rather than new kids going to preschool that weren't um, going before. We did find lots of evidence and other variables that we looked at that were consider consistent with narrowing. So we looked at a bunch of 
pretty much any variable we could find that looked at kind of parental investments in their kids. And in those variables, we saw lots of patterns consistent with narrowing. So for example, this is the likelihood that parents read to their kids three times a week. And you can see just by looking, comparing the orange line to the green line that everybody is basically saying they're more likely to read to their kids over time. But that increase is much more substantial on the, bottom, on, on the bottom of the distribution. And that was kind of the pattern across a whole bunch of different um, variables we looked at. So this is trips to the library, visits to the zoo, visits to the museum, but across a bunch of the kind of parental investment measures that we had, it seemed like we were seeing across the board increases, but more pronounced among lo low income kids. One of the areas where we saw huge um, increases and also uh, in, in behaviors and also narrowing of the gaps had to do with computers. So this is just the likelihood that you had a home computer. You can see there's a very large increase that low income families had a home computer um, and that kids used those computers uh, for educational purposes. So playing um, reading or math games on a computer. Um, so it seems that kids' home environments were changing in a way that would potentially be consistent with this um, narrowing. It wasn't um, across the board. There were some variables where this is um, access to the internet at home. And you can see here, there was a very, very large increase from very low levels of availability in 98 to um, much growth. The growth was larger amongst higher income families. But in general, this one's sort of an exception. The bulk of the variables we looked at were really consistent with um, low income families changing their behaviors more. Okay, so then we wanted to say, we've noticed all these um, trends. If we go back to the pattern reported in Sean's paper about the narrowing achievement gap, if we try to throw the various things we looked at, so the use of the internet, the reading to your kids, the child care, public child care, any of those variables into the models, can we sort of explain the narrowing achievement gaps over time? So basically running regressions, predicting kids reading and math scores across between 98 and 2010, and adding different combinations of these um, child care and parental investment variables to see um, if we could, just in a descriptive way, explain some of this um, gap narrowing. So I won't spend um, a ton of time on, on, on the specifics here, but basically um, what we found, if you think of this as the gap, so this is sort of the, um, the narrowing controlling for demographics. We found that controlling for all the kind of parent and home environments, we, we took it from a 0.2 change to a 0.1 change. So basically we could ha explain half of the narrowing over time by the things we saw in our model. And what seems um, really interesting about that is that um, it, just putting in the childcare variables into the models explained about, about um, a quarter of the gap. And that seemed counterintuitive because I showed you the trends and the trends seem to, at least by our hypothesis around um, preschool being useful for um, children's school readiness, um, we would have thought that it would go the other way. Um, and so we've been digging into that a little bit and trying to figure out what, what is driving that. And so we've tried to decompose the trends to figure out, is it something about the changing rates of participation in preschool, which seem to go counter, or could it be that the relationship between going to preschool and kids' outcomes have changed over time? And where we ended up is much more on the latter. What we see is that the coefficient on being in public preschool is twice as large in 2010 compared to uh, in 98, suggesting that you know, the association is stronger. And the way we've interpreted that is that there are, uh, have been changes in the quality of the preschool experiences um, kids uh, have experienced over time and that that has um, led to some of the narrowing in addition to the large changes in, in parenting practices that seem important as well. Um, okay, so I know I'm close to out of time, but I will briefly talk about um, these efforts to um, improve quality, which has become much more a focus in um, recent years, sort of since the Eccles data has come out. Um, it's a I think quality has a, uh, the potential to be really important for, inequality, uh, for narrowing gaps in achievement. We have lots of evidence that low income kids are going to substantially worse programs than higher income kids. 
um, even in highly regulated programs like Georgia's pre-K program, where you see that low-income communities have really good access to programs and on structural measures, um, they, they do really well. The actual interactions between the teachers and children are much, much worse in low-income communities than in high-income communities. And so quality has been sort of our um, sort of best candidate explanation about how to, how to make scaled up preschool programs work and how to kind of get a return on those uh, benefits. So really um, briefly, uh, in response to that, there's been a really big push to improve quality and one strategy towards doing that was to introduce um, quality rating systems, which are basically the idea is to take accountability into early childhood. And um, you can see that um, the Race to the Top Early Learning Challenge spent a lot of um, resources on incentivizing states to put these systems into place and currently most states have one. The idea of these systems is basically to get, um, to measure quality as, as well as you can and then to create incentives for improvements of quality and also to publicize the quality measures so that low-income parents um, have information about their choices and can opt into um, better programs and so that centers have incentives to um, improve. We don't have a lot of data yet about whether these things um, work in large part because there's not a lot of data. In many states, these programs are voluntary and small. Um, so what we don't know yet is if we really know how to measure quality well enough so that we're incentivizing the right things, if low-income parents are going to be responsive to the kind of information there, um, and if programs respond to the quality. And so that, that, that's kind of the areas um, where I'm working on most now. Um, I think there's a lot of potential here. There's lots of evidence that parents um, can't assess quality very well and that they don't spend a lot of time, close to any time, comparison shopping. So in a project we're doing in Louisiana right now, we surveyed about 1,000 parents of kids in public preschool and saw um, about two-thirds of them did, oh, did not visit a center other than the one that their child went to. 40% they didn't, said they didn't even consider another preschool. And here you can see that those patterns are really kind of linked to parental education. So the more educated the parents are, the more likely they were to have gone um, through it. So it seems like the information component has a lot of um, potential. And I'll just close um, with a little, um, uh, a little window into a, a project I'm working on with Tom right now where we got um, really rich data about one of the longest standing quality rating systems um, in the country, that's in North Carolina. They've been doing this since the late 90s. Um, and one of the very cool things about their program from our perspective, other than that it's not voluntary, it's huge, all centers have to participate. Um, they have collected really rich data. They've given us the really rich data. So all those things have been kind of stars that align. But one very cool thing about it is that there is an observation measure um, that's a component of it. And very small um, changes in that observation uh, measure gives, uh, give us um, exogenous variation in, in, in program star ratings. And so we can do kind of a uh, RD to look at the effects of star ratings on program quality. And an encouraging note so far is that it appears that programs that you know, just miss being, say, a, uh, a four-star rated program and therefore miss the incentives are more likely to show improvements moving forward. And also that programs that just miss the incentives see drops in enrollment, suggesting that potentially parents are um, sensitive to quality information when it's easy to see and post it on the door of a child care center. So um, just to wrap up, um, I think scaled up preschool initiatives, which is sort of where we're putting a lot of energy into right now, are unlikely to have the desired effects, particularly on inequality, unless there's kind of heightened focus on quality. And I think at least our very preliminary evidence suggests that these accountability efforts are one um, encouraging potentially encouraging way to improve quality, particularly if um, people also focus on the I. The I is uh, quality rating and improvement systems. So if there's also resources to actually help centers um, get better. Thank you.